Hello, hello, hello. So glad that you're all here. Uh, I know if you've been in our church any length of time, you know we like to mess with the seating in this church. So uh, you can tell me if you hate or love it. We're going to keep messing with the seating from time to time anyway. So uh, this is what we're doing for tonight. We may do it longer, probably not. Uh, but we're going to be talking about Ash Wednesday and Lent. We're also wrapping up our series on emotionally healthy spirituality uh, as we kind of continue moving forward as a church and saying, how do we live into habits and life that really brings flourishing in life? Uh, I told you a few weeks ago uh, that I, my, my family and I, we got a new dog. And I, I had to pull out my dog training book that I've had since I had my first dog. It's called Dog Training for Dummies. And so I got that book out and uh, got that book. And, and one of the first things it said was, your dog is happiest when it's pleasing its master. And of course, since I'm a pastor, I'm just going right into that, right? I'm thinking, that's it. And I wanted to start with that tonight. You find your highest joy when you're pleasing your Savior. If you think back in your life, you think back, you're like, I'm right in the zone. I'm right in that area where I know God wants me to be. You just feel it. You feel that like, here I go. You're, you just feel that confidence in your life. And then we start drifting and other things come up and we start getting busy, even sometimes good things. And suddenly you go, well, you know, you know, I, I'm still God's, God's still number one. I just don't treat him like that. God's still number one, but something else in my life. So going in the dog training book, uh, it says your highest goals, the dog's highest goals, please master, that's where it finds its joy. Going through that, our highest joy is pleasing our Savior. But then the dog training book says this, you have to be disciplined even when you don't want to. It's not about you. It's about your dog. So if you don't feel like going for a walk, you go for a walk. If you, want to, if you let him have bad habits, or her, of course, have bad habits, then you're going to be angry later on because you were lazy when they were young. you got to get those good habits into them. And of course, like I said, since I'm a pastor, that's just right where we're going on with this. You have to have good habits in your life. Those habits are deeper than just what you feel like. It leads to a deep life of joy in God, and those things go together. Okay, here's what it says in Acts chapter 2. If you got a Bible, look it up. I'll read it out loud. The verses aren't going to be on the screen. We'll do some verses on the screen later. Um, but this, these are just foundational verses. Um, in fact, in kind of Christianity, uh, sometimes Christians will talk about being an Acts 2 church. That dream of being a church that looks like this church from Acts chapter 2. Like, I wish we could be that. But I think we often get the things in the wrong order. Here's what it says. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, breaking of bread, literally, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, and they shared the money with people in need. They worshiped together at the temple. How often? Each day, every day, I know you're thinking that would be the greatest thing in the world if you just come to church every day. That's, that's what they're doing. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. The people in their community said, those are good people. I can go to them if I have needs. That's how the, their Christians were viewed. And every day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That's the sort of church that people thought, oh man, if we could have that, that was incredible. And this church was not perfect. They have problems. We can study that and talk about that another time. But this is a church that we go, man, they had goodwill. There was generosity. People were selling possessions. They were helping people in need. This is just this incredible church. But you know what we all forget? We all forget the beginning verses. They were devoted. Devoted to certain key rhythms of life. The apostles' teachings, basically the teachings about Jesus. They wanted to live the way of Jesus. In fact, Early on, they weren't called Christians. They were called followers of the way. That Jesus is a way of walking. It's a way of living life. It's not just this test you have to pass. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Yep, done. It's actually a way of living life, and you don't live it alone. You live it with God in his power, not just your willpower. It's a way of living life. People can tell by the way you live if you're walking in that way. And there's something powerful about that. There's a discipline in that. And so they are devoted to the apostles' teaching. They are devoted to prayer. They are devoted to uh, uh, gathering, to fellowship, to being together, and to sharing in meals, breaking of bread. Those habits, those what we call in our church roots, lead to the fruit. 
you can't fake the fruit. If you do, it tastes pretty plastic, right? It doesn't look, it's not real. It may look real, but it's not real. You don't want to do that. Uh, we've been going through a book in our church called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Of course, the sermons are always on the Bible, but we've been taking some topics from that. And here's what the author, Pete Scazzaro, says about a rule of life. This is something that Christians have. You may call it habits, but a rule of life is basically writing down a series of habits that you have to try to help you have some structure to your spiritual life. You have structure in your life, whether you believe it or not. Everyone has habits. You have good habits, you have bad habits. But I have people go, I'm just not good with my habits. Well, you, you have habits. You wake up every day. That's a habit. You brush your teeth. You, you shower, right? You get into a car, or at least you ride in the car. You have habits. You have habits. The question is, what are your good habits? What are your bad habits? What is your rule of life? You have a rule of life. The question is, are you being intentional about your spiritual life? Or are you one of those people who says, I shouldn't have to focus on my spiritual life. It should just happen. Let me just tell you, that's like saying you shouldn't have to be healthy. It should just happen. Well, if you're going to, especially as you get older, if you're going to be healthy, you have to actually focus on it and pay attention to it and have some discipline in it. Otherwise, you're going to start feeling bad physically and spiritually as well. Here's what Peace Cazero says. A rule of life is an intentional conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything we do. This doesn't mean you're at church all the time, but work, relationships, home, rest, weekend, that you're, God's as much as part of your Friday night as he is your Sunday morning. The starting point and foundation of any rule is a desire to be with God and love him. I think it's important that he says that because the starting point and foundation is not that you're gooder than other people. Not that you're trying to prove something to someone else or even to yourself. It's that you're saying, God, I want to be close to you. And these are the things that help keep me close to you. Theme verse of our church is Jesus saying, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Those last two lines are really important. If you remain in me, you will bear fruit. So the habits are all about staying abiding and rooted in Jesus. So it's not if you want patience, you work hard for patience. You may get patience, but you may not find kindness, right? You see what I'm saying? Or you might find kindness, but you may not have self-control. To really get all the fruit of the Spirit, you have to be rooted in Jesus. But Jesus says, actually, apart from me, you can do nothing. So if any of you tried starting a good habit in your life and failed miserably, besides me, okay? I know. There's only two types of hands, right? The hands that are up and the liars. I sit, I sit in this room, okay? Let's talk about Ash Wednesday and Lent. Let's talk about kind of why we do this thing. Ash Wednesday and Lent, these are good times to change some permanent habits in your life. You may have things like gossip or complaining, or you have a habit in your life. Could be your health, could be your diet, could be your spiritual life. This is a good time to say, this is something I want to change in, in my life permanently and you, we handed you out a card. You came in. If you need one, raise your hand. We've got ushers. They can hand you one. We can hand you a pen. If you need a pen, they're all around the sanctuary. I want to encourage you, fill out that card. You might say, this is a change I need permanently in my life. This could be something I'm taking away from my life or something I'm adding into my life. Like, I want to read my Bible a few times a week or daily. We have daily devotions that we just put out. A new one started on Sunday. This might seem weird. It's through the book of, of Numbers, but there's some really cool stories in that book. Uh, and ironically, the devotion today was about putting God in the center of your life. Uh, and so just kind of a neat thing, how those tie in. So if you need that, you can grab that on the way out. Um, there might be things that you're taking out or adding in, could be permanent. It also could be temporary. That's what many of us sort of associate. If you know anything about Lent, it's, well, I gave up red meat on Fridays, or I gave up chocolate, or I gave up sweets, or I, I added this in. I wanted to go for a prayer walk at night. I'm not doing that for the rest of my life. I just want to do that over this, this period of time. That's something you can do on a temporary basis. And the point of doing that is to remind you that Jesus gave up his life. And so you're giving up something on a temporary basis. And every time you're like, oh, I want chocolate, or oh, I miss soda, you remember Jesus and his sacrifice for you. And you go, I can sacrifice a little to remind me of the one who sacrificed a lot out of love for me. It's a good kind of reminder about that, okay? Another thing I want to encourage you to do 
in Lent, as you're thinking about what you want to add or what you want to take away. This isn't quite for every single person, but for most of you it will be. I want you to think about adding in, this could be taking away, depends how you see it, rest that is truly restorative. You know what I mean by rest that doesn't actually restore you? You know, I and mean, people are like, I totally rested. I just did laundry all day. I go, do you feel better? And I feel mad at people. They should be doing their own laundry, okay? <laughs> and that it's not restorative rest. I want you to think about putting in rest that's truly recharging, that's truly just without judgment on yourself, unless it's immoral. What is the rest that fills you up? And stop blaming anybody else for not having it and go get it. Plug into the wall. Your phone is not going to do much with a dead battery. And you and me, we often go through life saying, I got 3% on my battery. And anyone can call me. It's fine. And you know as well as I do, when your battery is low, you start looking at that person going, I'm not talking to you. (laughs) I don't have energy for you right now. But when your battery is full, you go, yeah, it's great. Let's talk. Changes everything which is why one of God's earliest commands, and I think it's nuts. I don't know if you think it's nuts. I think it's nuts. God has to command us to rest. And I think it's nuts that we disobey him. Maybe in this Lent time, I want to encourage you as your pastor, find rest. Do me a favor, take a minute. I'm going to say a couple more things before we go into our next kind of time of worship. Take a minute and fill out some things on that Lent card. I'll give you a minute to do that. I'm going to get a drink. We'll talk a little bit about this before we go back to worship. A couple of years ago, our church did a media fast. I asked people, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in our world. I asked people, hey, consider giving up the news. Consider giving up social media. This wasn't for Lent. It was just for a month. I said, give it up. I said, consider giving up music for a certain time of the day. Consider going to bed or waking up in the morning and not looking at your phone right away. Consider giving up video games. By this point, I'd lost the audience. (laughs) But a lot of people took it up. In fact, most of our church took it up. And it was crazy. People came back and said, this changed my life. I took that time. I was obsessing over the news. This was right in the middle of the pandemic. I was obsessing over the news, obsessing all those stuff. I took that time and I spent it in prayer or reflection or calling people or being the friends, being with word or exercising. And it changed my life. January was over. And they said, I'm not going back. I don't, what do I need to know about the news? This person's thing was the news. Change your life. I just want to just say to you, if you change a habit, you can change your life. But the problem for so many of us is we try to change our habits in our own power. And friends, I want to encourage you as Christians, we're not called to willpower. We're called to God's power. The Bible says the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. We have the power of the Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead living inside of us, and yet we insist on relying on our own power rather than his. The secret of life, the secret of a disciplined life is not willpower, it's surrender. And so I want to ask you as you make these commitments to God, Make real commitments. Make things going, go, just go for it. I know you might be discouraged going, I've tried and there's no point. It's not going to change anything. It can change things. You change a habit. You can change your life. It really is. You really are the, 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 the fullness of all the habits you've done your whole life. That's how you got to where you're at. That's how you get through school. That's how you get into a sport. That's how you get to your job. You have habits. That's how it happens. And the same thing can happen in your spiritual life. But you need to lean into God's power You need some accountability in your life. We all try to do our habits on our own and it doesn't work because we get discouraged. If you get someone else in your life encouraging you, challenging you, saying you can do it, it changes everything. If you can lean into God's power, if you can have that accountability, if you can have that follow through, it makes a huge difference. Okay, I want to encourage you to live into that. Uh, You can still have more time to fill that out. Um, and my hope is that we can just make this kind of a normal thing in our church, which we've been doing this for years and years. So we're going to actually do some more worship. I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up on stage. We're going to do some time of worship and do some time of reflection. I want you again, just to look back down at that list. If there's anything else, you go, God, I feel like you're nudging me to do this. I feel like you're encouraging me in this way. Who are some people in your life that you can ask 
to give you some accountability. See, the youth group's already talking about it right now. See, they're doing a great job. They're saying, what about you? What are you doing? I love that. That's what we need to be doing. And I want to just say to all of you adults, you see even what our youth are doing? They're even saying, look what I'm doing. They, you don't have to be ashamed of saying, hey, I'm trying to make a commitment to Jesus. You can actually go for it, okay? So I'm going to hand it over to the worship team, and we'll do some more worship. The church that I grew up in did not really do anything with Lent. In fact, some people I knew said, Lent's a cult thing, or at least for Catholics. They just didn't know what to do with that. But then uh, we got a youth pastor in, and he came from more of a traditional background, and he said, no, we're actually going to celebrate this, but he was very down-to-earth type of guy, liked to have fun. And he said, we're going to do these traditions of the church because they have a lot of meaning in them. We just need to understand what they are and what they mean so that you know what's going on with them. And I want to talk for a couple of minutes about that as we kind of move towards our time of ashes. Our kids are getting their ashes on uh, as well. So it's very cool. We'll kind of all be in here at the end and we'll see everyone with their ashes. It's going to be great. Okay, but why do we do this? And what, what's even the point of it? Let's talk about that. Let's first talk about Lent. Lent is a season of the Christian calendar. We all know that we have holidays and Christian and, and, and times in the, our year. Some of those are national holidays or things like that, but there's also a Christian calendar. And this calendar transcends nationality. This is done across the globe. It's been done for generations. It was done before America was even born. There's different seasons, and our, our year as Christians actually begins with Advent, not with New Year's, not with Christmas, it begins with Advent. So just check that out. It begins with us longing for the coming of Christ. That's the beginning of our year. That's how we start the year, longing for Christ, because we're still longing for Christ's second coming. So it begins with this anticipation. We are people of hope. We're people of anticipation, even when the world is in darkness. That's kind of how we start the year. And then Christmas comes, and it reminds us that God keeps his promises. Jesus came once. He'll come again. And then uh, we move into a time of called Epiphany and different things like that, 12 days of Christmas. We've talked about that before. And then we're heading into the season called Lent. And this is the 40 days before Easter. It doesn't include Sundays, uh, because this is a time to remember the sufferings of Jesus, Remember the sacrifices that he's made. These seasons have different colors. You'll notice that we change the colors on our cross uh, as the seasons go through. Sometimes there's no color up there. Um, we can go into all that stuff, how all those things work together. There'll be black on there for Good Friday. These are just different times. The reason it's gray is that's a sign of mourning. We'll talk about ashes in a minute. And the purple is that we believe that our king, the king of the universe, the creator of the universe, actually walked this planet as a lowly servant and suffered the king suffered. Is that what all the fairy tales say? Is that our typical script? Is that what we say? Hey, I can't wait to grow up and suffer like Jesus. This is a different way. This is the way. And I think when we try to sugarcoat everything, literally put sugar on everything, then when suffering comes, we don't know what to do with it. We have no script to put it in. And I don't know if you know, our world, especially our country, struggles with that. They don't know what to do when hard times come because no one has given them a framework to put it in. Even though so many of us are Christians, we don't know how suffering fits into God's plan. Even as followers of Jesus. That's what I want us to do. I want us to do that as, as adults. I want us to pass that on to our young people when they're going through their hard times that they say, I know how this fits into the framework of real life of life that's really life. And Lent is a great reminder of that. And I wonder with my tradition growing up, if it wasn't so much that we were afraid of ashes being put on our heads, I wonder if we were afraid of sadness. I wonder if we were afraid of a season of repentance and mourning, because that kind of is what Lent's about. And in our kind of day, it's like, no, just be happy all the time. 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 Is that working? You feel like sometimes you got to manufacture a fake little smile, especially at church. You got to put on that fake smile. You got to look good. Can't complain. Can't tell you your problems. It's not working. And thankfully, praise God, it's not in the Bible. Praise God, it's not even in the Christian tradition. There's these traditions of Lent where we can say, hey, this is a time where we can actually confess and focus on Christ's suffering and what he's done for us, and that we're forgiven. So if we're forgiven, we can admit what we've done wrong. 
And so many Christians don't do that, and that's causing major problems because we're not even willing to admit all the things we do wrong. We can confess. Lent reminds us of some very important things. It reminds us that we are sinners who need repentance. If I were to ask anybody, do you think that you're a sinner, Christian or non-Christian? They go, yeah, I mess up. I know everyone messes up, no problem. And I go, do you spend time thinking about the things you've done wrong and actually giving them to God and trusting that he's forgiven you? Nope, don't do that. Christians don't do that. Non-Christians don't do that. We never actually look inside and go, are we aware of what's going on inside of us? This is a time in Lent to actually take some time every day and actually go, God, I need to look inside. If you are the light, then where is the darkness? Can I be honest? Can I stop blaming it on my circumstances? Can I stop blaming it on the people around me, especially those I love? I blame them. Can I stop saying I'm not in control? And you're not in control of everything. I know that. But it's so easy just to hoist those things on other people instead of going, God, you're with me. You never promised it would be good all the time. In fact, you promised it would be bad. In fact, Jesus, the one we follow, had a hard life. But he said, I will be with you. God's promise in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, is this, I will be with you. God's with you. God is with you. God is with you. The cross, the resurrection, reminds you that God is with you. When your life's falling apart, when your friends desert you, when you're ashamed of what's going on inside, God is with you. God loves you. He'll never leave you. He pursues you. He loves you. This is the story that we live in as Christians, and we need to act it out almost so that we remember what we're all about. That's one of the things that Lent reminds us of. It reminds us that we're saved through his suffering. And this goes right on to this third point right here. Suffering, check this out, because you're not going to learn this in the typical kind of values of our culture. Suffering is part of a godly and joyful life. Now, you and I could dissect our culture and go, you know, when we hear about our heroes or superheroes, they have to go through hard times to become the superhero, right? We know that. And then we go, let's, I want to go through that hard times too to become the superhero. And we go, no, no, I just want to be the superhero. I don't want to go through the hard stuff. You read a book. We know this is part of the protagonist's journey, the hero's journey. God, that's not just that someone made that up. That, that's built into the DNA of who we are. Suffering and hard times and overcoming is part of the wiring of who we are as human beings. We're overcomers. Jesus is our perfect example. But the problem for so many of us, like I said before, is we go into our hard times and we don't know how to put it into the grid of Jesus because we have taken seasons like Lent and we try to delete them from our lives. We don't embrace the path of suffering that is the way of Jesus so that when suffering comes, because it's going to come, it's going to come, so that we can train our children and our youth and our young adults and our adults, because the adults need training too, that when suffering comes, God is with you. Walk in the way of Jesus. Walk in the way of Jesus. When your finances are struggling, your marriage is falling apart, you don't know what's happening with your work, who knows what's going on with your mental health. God is with you. Suffering is part of life. And with God, it's part of the path of freedom. This doesn't mean we don't stand up against injustice or change things that need to be changed. In fact, we do change things that need to be changed, starting with our own habits. But it means we know that God's with us through it all. Ashes, what are they? Why do we do them? Ashes, are, first of all, are a symbol of death. They're a symbol of Christ's death. They remind us that Jesus died for us. We're saying we identify with the one who died for us. That's kind of a bold statement in our day and age. I identify with Jesus. I am unashamed of the cross of Jesus Christ. I can identify with him. It reminds you and me that we're frail from ash you were made, from dust you came, and to dust you'll return. You and I aren't unlimited. Do you sometimes act like you're unlimited? Like you can do it all and say yes to everything and everyone, and, and you'll have no problems. You act like you'll live forever. You act like you can do whatever. You can spend whatever. This is a reminder that you are 
frail. And there's only one who's eternal. Only one. And it's not you. And it's not me. But we get to worship him together. The ashes are a symbol of death. Jesus' death and your death. Okay? They're also a sign of mourning. Mourning, I talked about before, this idea of confession. This idea of God I know my sin is part of the darkness of the world. It's not just everybody else. I'm putting it out into the world. I'm part of the problem. You don't have to be the biggest part or the smallest part. You're just just part. And you finally take that chance in Lent to say, everyone knows they've messed up. How How about I take some time to actually look inside and mourn? Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. The fact that we don't understand that verse is a symptom of there's something that Jesus taught that we don't understand. We need holidays like this. Here's what it says in James chapter 4. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Your loyalty is divided between God and the world. There's no comparison. There's no comparison. Which one will truly bring you flourishing life? Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of... He's not saying forever and ever and ever, but seasons where you actually weep for what you've done. and say, No big deal. Everyone else's fault. Jesus forgave me. Done. To actually do this thing in Christianity we call repentance. To actually own what's in there without condemnation because Jesus has forgiven you. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. But you can still repent. There's a process of doing that. And gloom instead of joy. So humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. In 1 John, it says this. If we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some people take that as a thing of going, great, I don't have to think about my sins. Jesus, I sinned. I just said something really mean to someone. I feel bad about that. God would never want me to feel bad. So God, forgive me. Great, I don't have to apologize to them. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to confess. I don't have to repent. Jesus took away all my bad feelings because my parents told me they want me to be happy all the time. So God must want me to be happy all the time. And I just can pray and confess and I'm done. You feel like we're missing something? We're not supposed to wallow in condemnation. Jesus died. But we are supposed to own and change, and weep. And there are times to do that. And the crazy thing is, friends, when you do that, you will actually find more freedom. You'll find more authenticity. You'll start confronting your own hypocrisy. Because we all have it. All of us, not just Christians. Every human being on the planet is a hypocrite. Nobody lives what they believe. Nobody But unless you're willing to look inside in love, love, not condemnation, forgiveness, not shame, you'll never become free. This is why we do these things. And I think it's so important. And I've been doing this, friends, since I was in high school. I used to think, someday I'll have to stop saying why we do Lent and Ash Wednesday. And every year, someone comes up and goes, why are we doing that cult thing? And I go, okay, we've got to explain this again. And I'm just going to say it again and again, and I'm okay saying this the rest of my career, because I think this is such an important counter-cultural message. And you know what I found in our culture? People are actually hungry to hear, is this a safe space to mourn? Is this a safe space to repent? Because I know I got junk. And I don't feel like there's any safe face to go, God, I am messed up without you. I need you. Forgive me. And then to let it go. If Jesus carried it on the cross, stop carrying it on your shoulders. 
We're going to move forward towards ashes. Take some time to reflect. You can keep filling out your card. You can let this be what you need it to be. Obviously, the room's set up different, so I'll explain how you're going to do it. You're going to walk towards the back of the room. You're going to come down the middle here. You'll get your ashes on here, and then you'll go back around and head to your seat, however you need to head to your seat. Remember, we're frail, but loved. You are the children of God. Take your time, and when you're ready, come forward for your ashes.